All right. Okay. Um, this 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 conversation between um, Gary Young and Olivia Ruta um I, I have permission from both of them to give very brief introductions, um, including some um, fantastical elements like Gary is, I have to emphasize his life of fighting crime and his various superpowers. Um, and I have to emphasize Olivia's um, superpower in, in um, destroying all um, Birkenstocks and um, uh you know uh, pretenders to fashion but anyway apart from that um we, we've got two amazing scholars here um uh, to give a, a, this conversation um gary young many of you guys will know him um from his work on the guardian for years across the world including in the us um he's a, a familiar face and a, and a familiar uh, writer um and he's he's now at the university of manchester in, in the sociology department so we're we're really excited that Gary's here speaking to us dudes in IR. Um, it's, it's really going to be interesting. And, and the, the perfect companion for that is our, um, our own scholar in IR, Olivia Ruta Zibwa, who, who uh, many of you will know for her work on development studies, critiques of development studies and, and decolonial IR. And she's at the University of Portsmouth um, and, and she'll be heading to LSE very soon, right? Um, so we, we called the, 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 the panel um, Geographies of Racism, and, and to be honest, that came out of a, uh, a preliminary um, informal conversation the three of us had about um, what, what the conversation might go like. So the Geographies is really just a, a heuristic device, so we're not making any um, kind of intervention <laughs> into the field of geography or anything like that, but I would, I would say the Geographies are a useful heuristic insofar as they intonate that racism is a, is a global um, um, technology of power and domination, um, yet that power and domination is extremely unevenly um, spread across the world. And it certainly, not, uh, doesn't, certainly doesn't render a smooth space. So, so that's the kind of heuristic which we're, which we're using to, to have this conversation. And what I'm going to do is I've got three questions um, for Olivia and Gary, and um, they're going to have a uh, response to those, each of those questions, about a 15 minute response. And then um, we're going to have a five minute interaction with, with, with the audience. Um, and then we'll go on to the next section and do the, do the same thing. In the next section and do the same thing and then hopefully we'll be left with with 20 minutes of a, of a general conversation at the end uh so with that we're going to get started with the very, with the first question um and that's about how we understand the taking up of black lives matter in various locales across the world um, conventional narratives and understandings of racism tend to be nation-based perhaps region-based um so how do we how might we better assess the import of BLM if we were to think of geographies of racism beyond simply the nation or even the region. Um, let's start. Who wants to go first? Okay. <clears throat> uh, I mean, I think one place to start is with American hegemony. That um, Nobody's talking about the anniversary of Benjamin Hermanson or uh, Stephen Lawrence outside of their locales, but America has the uh, power, the reach to, um, to affect and intervene um, elsewhere. Um, and, it, and, and it did uh, in a very kind of uh, uh, powerful way. But then there was the kind of, um, the interpretation of what that meant, wherever it, I kind of described the, the, the effect of Black Lives Matter in America elsewhere as being like a pollination. It kind of, it blew and it spread and it landed in a range of places in a range of different ways. And, um, um, you know, it was far to Piet in Holland. Uh, it was, um, to begin with statues in Britain, in, in France, it pretty much stayed with police domination, but it reached, there was a statue defaced in Greenland. Uh, so there was nowhere where this 
pretty much Iceland had demonstrations, Finland did. There was nowhere where this um, language wasn't spoken. And so there it became, um, just to mess up my metaphors a bit, like various dialects of the language. So you have the language of racism and then you have these dialects wherever wherever it may wherever it may land so the the british version the and the british response to that version the dutch the belgian uh uh which uh which however and there was lots of overlap and more lots of similarity and there was also things that were very distinct as one would expect from uh uh from a dialect and one of the kind of particularly interesting things I thought <clears throat> was the degree to which the pushback in all places was quite similar, which is we are not America. Actually, these places that in a range of ways aspire to be America in all sorts of things. And I've imported an awful lot of um, Trumpian stuff of the language of the kind of, of uh, you know, trying to adapt it to their uh, way of life and trying to adapt American politics and economics, that model to our way of life. In this moment, this attempt to say, but that's not us. And, uh, and it reminded me of a, a meeting that we had at The Guardian in um, around the time of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry uh, so a long time ago, um, which was also when um, uh, a man was beheaded pretty much in Jasper, Texas. Uh, and then one of my colleagues, we talked about Stephen Lawrence and we talked about this awful lynching in Jasper, Texas. And he said, at least we don't do that here. And there was, you know, and I said to him, well, that will not be very much um, comfort to the parents of Stephen Lawrence. And so this attempt to kind of rank racism, not to imagine a world without it, but instead to imagine where racism is better um, uh, and where it is worse and how Britain, Belgium, Holland, wherever, could take comfort, a weird perverse comfort in the fact that this was happening in America, and at the same time, deny the experiences of people closer to home, and in some way claim that they were inauthentic, that the racism there, which very few people who want to be taken seriously would deny, was in some way insufficient to be regarded as on that, um, uh, on that level. So I, 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 I'll leave my remarks there. Oh, thanks, man. Um, Olivia, we can we can bring up a, come back to a lot of that stuff. Yeah. So um, when I was thinking, because like you said, Robbie, this came out of our conversation, um, and I think also because I mentioned that during um, the last iterations, I guess, of uh, the Black Lives Matters um, protest uh, around George Floyd, I was in South Africa, and and I I lived the whole thing slightly differently. Um, in the sense that when I'm in Europe, I can sense what Gary was talking about, you know, in Belgium, I'm from Flanders, they, they take, yeah, the whole, the whole list of reasons why we shouldn't engage. But then if you want to be cool and walk, we can engage with it, right? But so that the conversations are pretty shallow. But I guess I was much more out of my comfort zone to um, experience the protests, apart from the fact that South Africa took the lockdown quite seriously. So we were locked into, um, the compound of the university, ban on alcohol sale, of all of the other things that are not important. But what was in, what was interesting is that the Black Lives Matters protests were organized mostly by um, maybe an overrepresentation of of white progressive liberals in Johannesburg, and and the the success obviously was was quite mixed. But you know, in the grand scheme of things, if you try and think about the the the, the call for Black Lives to Matter on the African continent. It gets, it gets a different engagement. And some of the things that people were saying um, was it's our lives have never met, mattered that much in general, the way that COVID has been talked about, but also has been uh, addressed in this continent shows it, but also uh, somehow I guess critiquing from a different angle, 
that this US hegemony in this conversation will not automatically bring the attention to um, Black lives in a way that expands it from Black people in Europe, let's say, and Black people in the US to Black life uh, on this planet. And, and I think that that, that was, that was a quite uh, important insight. So if I go with the heuristic of, um, of geographies, what I was thinking about is that maybe even before we think of it as, as, as place, and I know we don't mean it literally, but maybe also geographies as, as um, a location in time. And in that sense, engaging with Black Lives Matters, it, it still puzzles me how seemingly much more successful it has been in 2020 than 2015 when it started. So there's a lot to unpack there, I guess, uh, to what happened. Um, but also I think it is, it is an, an invitation to, to treat racism not necessarily as a, an abstract potential problem of ill character or something, but, but as stuff that actually happened in history and that continues to happen in the present, right? So if we then see racism as a historic project of life and death, that actually happened, that we don't have to philosophize it, but like it really, the material aspect of it, uh, in a sense, how connected it is to political economy, which brings us to development of capitalism, obviously, via empire, slavery, and colonialism. That I think is a way in which we can notice US hegemony of maybe how Black Lives Matters came to us, but we might not have to be wedded to it, right? So it can be a way to, to seize the moment of, I don't know, uh, the walk west to actually pay, thinking that they pay attention to something and then how do we make it meaningful? I think it is by connecting it to that. And then if we move to place, then um, it helps us understand that this, these historical process has have always been intra and transnational at the same time um, as phenomena, uh, but that they have these various manifestations along the line of the localized needs of that capitalist system, for instance, right? Or, um, and so for me, that helps to, to fight, I guess, some exasperation at the ritualized consternation with the discovery of, of racism, but also being cynical about all oh, Black Lives Matters, everybody's screaming this now, but do they really mean it? It's, um, I don't know, it, it just helps to give it a, a little bit um, of meat, I guess. And, and yeah, if, if we have to go into examples, but I can come back to some of those later as well. Um, I guess in my own life, to growing up in, in Belgium, it was, you grow up with the idea that if you work really hard, racism doesn't exist. So this abstract idea, right? That's something that you can choose or, or don't. And it was moving to Italy to go and study there to understand that racism is actually a thing, but also to accept it, but also how it's connected to life and death because most of my African friends there were the migrants that, you know, because of racism, had certain access or not to, to the economy of the country where they were, right? Apart from all the horrible treatments. Uh, and then moving to the UK to connect to what Gary was saying is that um, it's a whole different experience of racism where it just seems, I often say when I just arrived eight years ago, it was like, oh, racism is not that bad here. I do know much better now, <laughs> unfortunately. Again, it's not a thing to, to laugh about. But it helps us understand the details of how this racism manifests itself. And, and the idea, what I find quite powerful in the UK is that there is this seeming, um, Michael Richmond calls it uh, the anti-racism as a procedure, where it seems that the moment you call racism, somebody's willing to do an investigation or look at the legal aspects of it, whatever, but um, somehow it kind of neutralizes any actual anti-racist work. Right, so you feel like you're in a less racist space, but often the opposite is 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 true. Um, and I think again, uh, BLM helps us to to circle back to some of these insights that have been, especially in the UK, with us since the 60s, 70s, whatever. Like, so there's little new, but we can rearticulate some of it. I think. Yeah. Right. So, so a, a, a little question to Olivia. And then I'm going to do a, a very provocative question coming out what you guys said, purposefully provocative. <laughs> um, so, so Gary was talking about this, you know, we are not America, right? But, but we aspire, but we aspire to America in, all of, in other ways, but we're, we're not, oh, they do that crazy stuff over there. We don't, right? Olivia, what's, is it, what's your sense of elites 
in various parts of the African continent, whether they, you know, I'm thinking, say, with like, like the Nigeria stuff with the SARS police protests and all that, which wasn't necessarily Black Lives Matter, but it was all part of the same kind of ecology. Right? Do, do, would you put these elites in a different box to the European elites or the, or the other Western elites in terms of their response? Like, you know, we're, we're not America, although, you know, we, we aspire. Mm. So um, <clears throat> I think analytically, no, politically, one, one has to position themselves where they're answering this from, right? So if, if, if I'm a white politician and to avoid talking about our own police murder shit and I point at SAR in, 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 in Nigeria, then I say like, yeah, let's not go there. But let's say if, um, you know, both as researchers, but also I think it's questions for people from the, from the continent um, ourselves. There is um, what I find useful in this is to, to come back to this idea of connected histories. So the falseness of the claim, this is not America, is historically completely ridiculous if we were to, I mean, very simplistically say, no, but America is Europe, right? Or is a product of Europe. So like to disconnect these, 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 these histories just doesn't make sense even intellectually, historically but then also in practice. And so the, the African continent is an integral part of that um, from transatlantic slavery, but then the, the color, uh, colonization of the continent itself. So if we think of, of the question of racism as always interconnected anyway, then saying we are not America to say we have radically different problems does not really work. But on the other hand, I think, um, saying this is not America from uh, the African continent, not necessarily as its elites that actually behave as the colonial white elites did when they were there. So in that sense, um, but if you say it as um, peoples that are uh, subjected to the colonial practices of the African elites um, at the moment, then I do think that they ask us to pay at more attention to particular conditions of oppression that 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 are different, I think, and they are um, actually much more urgent. And if we were to attend to them, we would also, I think, solve or attend to a lot of the things that uh, migrant communities have in the West, right? So, in that sense, I would advocate for centering that even, because you just get a much bigger sense of urgency of the question of life and death. If 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 you start from there, so it's not a competition. You just see things yeah. slightly more clearly. But we have to be specific when we say this is not America. We have to be specific why we say it. Um, right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so coming off that, then, the, 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 the provocative kind of question I've got is, um, and maybe, Gary, you could, you could um, take this up, is, um, is, is racism only a thing, a thing as we know it, if it's in a, a white majority society you got I mean I'm saying that in terms of what Olivia was just saying about how these things or in your words how they yeah and 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 it's a good question and I think that the key to the question is as we know it I think yes as we know it it it, it is um I think that though that what one of the things was that was interesting about the pollination to me was the degree to which it was transferable. That kind of, um, and the degree to which some elements, um, uh, I would say reactionary elements within black communities were trying to um, draw an ethnic boundary around it and say, no, this is just about um, people of African descent. Mm. Uh, but that the, um, um, I think the the statue that was defaced in Greenland that was about Inuits. Mm. Uh, we could have been talking about um, the Roma. Um, that the, there's kind of the, the reason why it translated is because there's almost no country on earth that doesn't, if you understand black as a political color, that doesn't have black people. Yeah. The question is finding the way in which kind of you know that operates and it is really intriguing when you 
when um, I remember as a child learning about the Holocaust and learning about Northern Ireland and having only an understanding as a child, I was 10 or 11, of racism as being about colour and of discrimination as being about colour. And I just thought, well, how would they know? Mm. Why did they just not say I'm not Jewish or I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not Catholic or, and then realizing as I matured, well, in Northern Ireland, you're three questions away from knowing, you know, what school did you go to? What's your name? Where do you live? That um, uh, similarly uh, in Nazi Germany and that there are, um, if you need to know, you'll find out. Mm -hmm. And so that, that way in which if we understand for the purposes of this conversation, blackness as not being an ethnically specific category, but a political category, um, which speaks to a range of historical processes and economic and political exclusion, that it can find a home anywhere. There is no country without politically black people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, so we've got a little five minutes now. If if um, anybody wants to um, put uh, something in the Q and A, or if I don't know if we can, if you can, if you want to raise your hand, and I'll try and deal with it like that. Um, I mean, well, but any, any comments or questions? Sorry, Gary. Well, while we're waiting, and I will shut up as soon as. Yeah, man. No, no, please. Then. The, the question that Olivia asked was is a really good one about the time. Why now? Mm. Why this? Which I have often as a journalist, I wondered the same thing um, in Ferguson. What is it about this death? I mean, these are the reason why they resonate is because they're not uh, in any way un, either unexpected or unfamiliar. And so while it was grotesque, it was not rare. And I thought, interestingly, on that day that George Floyd was killed, there was also that incident in Central Park with the bird watcher and the woman yeah. who was screaming. That was in the morning. George Floyd was later on in the afternoon. And here was a woman in New York wearing a mask when she screams at the which is a kind of um, culture war thing in America. And when she screams at the police, she says there's an African-American man, even in her heightened sense of racism, she doesn't even say black, perfectly mm. polite. And so the, the way in which those two kind of um, uh, interconnected, not that they, not that one prompted or, you know, it was contextual rather than causal, but, um, um, the precise kind of um, alchemy that makes one move and others not move, I've, I've never quite been able to figure out. But also interesting was that it happened in the middle of a pandemic. Two things went viral at the same time, exactly. that video and COVID. Yeah. And so we had the brazen racism of the murder mm. And we had the more banal racism of the kind of systemic inequalities that were killing black people at disproportionate rate. And I felt that one of the challenges politically in that moment was to connect those two things. And so actually, you know what? COVID is killing black people more disproportionately than American police. If you care about this, you need to understand the slower, less dramatic forms that are um uh attacking us mm, yeah right so now i've got um actually a question from mira which 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 feeds directly into where we just left off um so what do you think the role of social media might be as a technology of political engagement in influencing how we think about the politics of race so olivia man mm. carry on <laughs> yeah um I think a bit the same way in which we see this resurgence of attention for BLM. Uh, it can nothing is nothing is opt automatic, right? So we see at the same time a heightened commodification of the attention to racism, 
meaning all the big brands are gonna, I don't know, endorse something which makes it a mood thing, the same way that universities are decolonizing everything, whatever, like, so in a way, social media in its attention can be used both uh, for this uh, mythical awareness raising, but also to then completely neutralize it. Um, so yeah, maybe my answer is then gonna be voluntaristic, but then, you know, if we want to engage it in a positive way, it will really mean for us to strategically use those means by not assuming automatically that they're, that they're good uh, or bad. But I, I, I would connect it to that because often people say that social media is not a real thing maybe and it's clicktivism and all of that. Um, I think what, what for me, the, the combination of the COVID pandemic and then the attention of what Black Lives um, did is to understand what happens when people that are usually not uh, need to think about the, their own vulnerability I think actually that's what happened mainly. A lot of um, Western liberals, white liberals in particular, were for the first time, maybe since the first, since the Second World War, let's say in Europe, forced to think about their own physical vulnerability. And if in a moment like that, something um, like this, the video that went viral um, of George Floyd, uh, yeah comes to their attention, it arrives in a different way, in a, less dis, you know, in a way that is maybe more intense than, than others. So obviously I'm not advocating, let's create situations in which everybody fears for their lives, right? But um, it, I think, makes us think maybe also as, as thinkers or activists, um, <coughs> how, how to connect these conversations about life and not just about being nice and stop being a dick and saying horrible things to, to people, but how, how the how who gets to live and who dies is actually the central question of racism and how that has manifested itself in different ways and how COVID has shown many things that even if you're white and rich, you might not always escape this, but mostly that those that are not are even doubly, triply more vulnerable to this apart from all the vulnerabilities that already exist. So that's how I would try to accept <coughs> this um, seemingly untangible things like social media or this the randomness of our attention to stuff um yeah maybe if we can trace some of material d distinctions um rather than just discourses that that might be that might be something or somewhere i'm thinking out loud clearly but yeah <laughs> that's what i have now <laughs> no that, that's that's great and 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 thanks because I, my old internet connection just went down and it came up, but hopefully no one noticed because oh, I am that. living in the third world. Right? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so um, Stenveli, come, come on, man. Stenveli. Can you un unmute? Yes, how are you? Oh, wow, I can unmute. Okay, I was now <laughs> typing my question because I was like, oh my God, I won't be able to speak. I just wanted to say that... Um, Olivia, I was also in Joburg during the lockdown and, and, and during uh, about George Floyd's uh, killing. And one of the things that was so interesting about that moment is that there'd been 11 people killed by the security uh, forces, by the police, or um, well, yeah, by the police uh, during the lockdown in South Africa by the time that George Floyd was, was murdered. And for many... Um, and all of those people were black, even though uh, both, even though I think at the time, uh, many white people were breaking lockdown regulations far more <laughs> to a much greater extent. So for many people, it was like, why does this one matter? Um, and the second thing is that it also then provoked a, 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 and, and triggered some thought, which I don't think has gone far enough around how racist forms of policing of governments continue even when black people are in charge um, and those colonial forms of policing of dealing with of governance continue even in the post colony so we saw um, many African countries using colonial laws to maintain lockdowns and to enforce lockdowns um, and and yet the sort of simple um, the sort of guilt-driven protests that you were seeing by many, mostly white South Africans all over South Africa, um, 
you know, was there to then avoid having to have any conversations about how racism continues to manifest in the present. Thanks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll your comment um, into a question by Julia and Siobhan, right? So <laughs> kind of just, so just, and then we're going to move on to the, to, the, to, the, to the second part, right? So Julia is, is talking about the specificity of police brutality in, um, in, in this pollination of um, Black Lives Matter um, and how that, how, how, how police brutality might be something which is, 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 is constitutive of the geographies that we're talking about. And I think that also links to um, Vaughan's um, question, which is, you know, that, that, that the Grenfell Tower thing, for example, was not a police thing. You know what I mean? It was, it, it was a, another, for, it linked, but another form of injustice, right? Yet that, whilst we had marches every month or wherever it was, you know what I mean? It, it didn't, and whilst at the time, at least for the two or three weeks after Grenfell, you know, that there were, it was almost like the area around Grenfell was a liberated territory for two or three weeks. But nonetheless, now it's a parliamentary process, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess the, the question is, what forms of oppression and violence and injustices are, are constitutive of, of the, 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 the taking up of Black Lives Matter? Or the, does that make sense? I wonder, Gary, if you could make sense of that for us yeah, in some way. I mean, I feel like wherever it, wherever it landed, it found its place. And so, um, you know, obviously in America, it, <clears throat> it started with the state, but it didn't end there um, in, any, in, in any manner or means. And that kind of, um, <clears throat> um, because America is more lethal, then its racism is more lethal because America is just generally more lethal. And so um, in different places, the conversation and the, um, the pressure points were, were in, you know, were, were in different places. And so people pushed <clears throat> where they knew to push and where they could push. And so sometimes that was the state uh, and state violence, but other times it was the curriculum or uh, it was the, the, you know, it was the statue, which was the symbol of something else. Or so, um, <clears throat> I mean, there's nowhere in the world, just there's nowhere that where you can't find black as a political color. There's nowhere where you'll find a state and you won't find state violence. And one of the natures of black as a political color is that whoever happens to be black in that moment is going to be on the rough end of that violence. So while there's nowhere where that wasn't understood, there were many places where in that moment it was not understood to be the priority. Um, <clears throat> I just want to uh, make a, just one more intervention, which connects to the, uh, uh, what was just said about South Africa and the kind of broader points about Africa, which is, my last book was about all the kids who were shot dead in one day in America. I just picked a day at random and all of the kids that fell that day, I <clears throat> profiled. And what became clear while doing that was that there were places where kids were supposed to be shot, where if a child was shot, it didn't interrupt anybody's understanding of how the world worked or how a city worked. It wasn't worth reporting. It wasn't really worth remarking. That is where people get shot. And then there were places where if people got shot, it challenged, you know, God, how could that be in that plaza, in that mall, in that place, in that school? And that <clears throat> there's something about that with this conversation that one of the reasons why something like George Floyd can resonate and therefore pollinate is because of America's vision of its, uh, its self-projection and the contradiction between the reali that reality and the place that we saw to the extent that Biden would say, this is un-American. And it's like, well, actually, it's about as American as you could get, actually. Um, <clears throat> and so um, 
Well, and so that, that I think that there is something about, you know, you said 12 people have been killed uh, by the state and that, that not interrupting necessarily how people understand black people in the state in that place. And, you know, when it, <laughs> when it comes to America, I think sometimes African-Americans are among the most surprised when something lands yeah. because they're like, well, we've been out here, for, we've been out here ever since, and nobody said a thing. Um, anyway, I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so so moving on to the next one, right? And both of you guys have been doing work on on um, blackness in Europe and racism in Europe. So how, how might we use the uh, this this kind of heuristic of geographies of racism to think about blackness in Europe? What kind of politics reveal themselves if we situate Europe within wider geographies of racism. Um, so, you know, not, not necessarily the, exception, the exceptionalism. Um, Olivia, let's start with you. Yeah, so again, I think my answer will be much more like brainstormy. Um, the first thing that I, that I noted was to, to think of this uh, in a non-exhaustive, but rather cumulative uh, way. So that really takes us immediately, I think, beyond identity politics as it is often misunderstood when, when we offer blackness. But I think we've already said that clearly by going to political blackness, but it's important to flag it up because when I see that we have finally conversations in, in Belgium or the Netherlands about blackness, France even tries, but doesn't really, but whatever. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the thing that even us as, 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 as the different uh, racialized, peoples is that we get caught up in this in this thing where we we feel that we need to claim an exceptionalism or or you know somehow pulled into this um hierarchies of suffering and there are places in which that makes sense but there's often also places in which that doesn't make sense but most importantly i think it just reproduces whiteness at the center of it so so i think that would be a first thing that for me the, the a, a generative way of, of invoking blackness in europe um, would be uh, that. Um, I already mentioned briefly that these conversations make me think or rethink to, um, and, and I got it from uh, Kuminda Bambra, this ideas of connected histories of connected sociologies. And I think we can make it a politics. We engage with anything to do with blackness or racism, just look for the connections rather than try to claim some exceptionality left or right. Um, and not just to be, I guess, historically, I don't know, excellent showing of all the knowledge we have, whatever, but I think it's the much, is the most powerful um, counter poison to the divide and conquer poison that is coloniality, but also the continuation of racism. And Europe is full of that, right? Very brief example, uh, this summer in Belgium, when the people woke up to, to, to Black Lives Mattering, uh, finally, we have a parliamentary commission that uh, decides to finally, <laughs> Um, you know, make good work of investigating um, colonialism, its colonial history, right? So they were gobbling together very, very quickly uh, a panel of experts that should then, you know, um, somehow accompany this commission. Um, they, they, they invited me to be part of it. And the reason why I raise it is that it reminded me to another politics I want to put here. Um, I think is the, the one is a, a politics of refusal of, for instance, this procedural anti-racism, refusal of divide and conquer, but also refusal of agenda setting by the white world to end white supremacy. That is not a thing. That's the thing that has been happening mostly, I think. Um, and uh, for me, it's especially the European experience that, that um, brings to this to the fore because people are so incredibly happy with themselves that they're finally talking about race, that they're not shifting anything. Um, the reason why I give this example as divide and conquer is that it does not make sense for a country like Belgium to single out the experiences of people of Rwandan, uh, Burundian and Congolese descent to need a whole um, parliamentary thing to figure out what happened in the past we already know, right? and then say that that is connected to an engagement with race and racism. So if you don't include all the new, uh, all the other migrations, but especially Islamophobia, especially like uh, the whole gendered aspect of it, right? But if you organize a commission and you just like pull apart some of, you know, these figureheads that happen to be from these countries, 
next to obviously all the very wise old um, white historians that our country has. But you leave out all the Moroccan Turkish and all the other organizations or the refugee organization that exist, then you know that you're not addressing racism in any meaningful way, right? And I think this uh, fantastic um, <laughs> race, it's not funny, but sometimes stuff is so horrible that it makes me laugh. But the the the, the CEO report or this, you know, report, the very recent report in the UK where you know tap ourselves on on, on on the back saying there is no institutional racism, it just it's mind-boggling, right? But again one of the things is you have good migrants and the bad ones so politics of refusal is another thing that came up but when i also think of europe inspired by the work by uh, gloria becker i think um a politics of white innocence right that's again specifically something that um i can speak mostly for white uh, for for continental europe but i see it in the uk uh, as well what what thinking about the position of blackness but even literally people of African descent um, does is that it shows the most clearly um, how the white establishment moves first and foremost always to a, a position of, of innocence right and, and Gloria Becker called it white innocence so the positive thing that she does in her work I think is that she takes the Netherlands uh, or to speak about racism in the Netherlands, she takes the Netherlands and the rest of its um, imperial territories as one analytical space, both in the past and the present. And again, it brings us to these connected history things. I think it's quite powerful to think about, for instance, the presence of people of African descent in Europe, not as them just being there, whether we're gonna allow them in or not, but how they are connected to where Europe has always been or was through the colonial experience. So if you take, for instance, Belgium, not as an analytical space, but Belgium, Congo, and Rwanda, um, uh, and Burundi as one analytical space, we have a different conversation about who is, has the right to be where. Um, and then very briefly, let me choose something. And I think very, yeah, that brings us to a different politics of aid and development. It, it shows itself as, apart from it seeing quite misplaced as misguided and you know it would it would help to think through repair or anything um, else but i think maybe and i'll just throw that one out um apart from a different politics of borders they again also reveal themselves as something that is untenable but also murderous i think what europe makes us talk think about is politics of indigen indigeneity and indigeneity in, for instance, Belgium is used as the most right-wing oppressive thing, right? Um, but I would say what it helps me think about is that for us to invoke indigeneity without making a power or oppression analysis, it cannot help us to do anti-colonial work or anti-colonial ethos. So that's that. So those are some of the things that come to my mind when I think of specifically what does studying blackness in Europe could it bring uh, in that geographic geography of racism conversation? Right. Yeah, that just laid out some awesome issues. Thanks, um, Gary. I'm going to be brief because uh, Olivia's taken all my best lines. Um, but, um, I'm minded um, of an interview I did with Angela Davis quite some time ago, and. Um, she was talking about the, the need to re-examine abolition, the abolition of slavery, and to, um, and to kind of bring it up to date. And I asked her, well, doesn't that leave politics entrenched in a paradigm that was set 150 years ago? Like, do we not need to move on some way? And she said, the problem is, and I'm quoting her here, the problem is that we haven't moved on. You only move on if you resolve these issues. It took a hundred years to get the right to vote, the right to vote. And that just to emphasize really what Olivia is saying, we have this really hard struggle in Europe, which is educating European people about their history. Uh, because for all of the um, culture war stuff about the defense of history, they don't know it. And I really mean they don't know it, not just that they don't agree with me about it. I mean, they don't know it in a way that there are very few Americans, however racist they are, 
who would deny that there was a thing called segregation, mm. or who would deny that there was a thing called slavery and that it happened there. But actually it's very difficult. You know, Gordon Brown can go to Africa and say kind of, um, we should be proud of what we did in the empire. Whereas George Bush, George W. Bush goes to New Orleans and has to say bad things happened in our past. And so <clears throat> that we are left. It's why the things about statues and Churchill and all that kind of stuff become so fraught. Because if you thought that Churchill was Mother Teresa, then of course, you're like, why are you taking down a statue of Mother Teresa? Not that Mother Teresa doesn't have her own problems, but you get my point. And, um, and so it's very difficult. It's very difficult to have a conversation when the, when the knowledge deficits, and I know that it's not an accident, these knowledge deficits, it's not like, oh, I just was away from school that week. It's very deliberate. <laughs> but the knowledge deficits are so significant and so partial, and it disables any kind of meaningful engagement. And sometimes you just have to skip a few stages and take the bloody statue down. And so I can't wait for you to learn what he did. It's coming down. And um, there is this, not the first time I said this, but this kind of very selective collective amnesia and memory where they say, we won the war, even if they didn't fight, even if they weren't born. We won the World Cup, even if they didn't play, even if they weren't born. <laughs> but when it gets to like colonization, like, well, we didn't do that. We weren't born. We weren't there. And so, and that's how you get a kind of put the great back into Great Britain, the kind of Brexit narrative, a range of things. It's very, um, uh, and I feel like this is a primary challenge for us. And I don't, have, I don't have any great answers as to how we meet that challenge as opposed to recognizing it for, for, for what it is. Yeah. And I mean, maybe, maybe just um, asking you guys another element of that, which might make it, I don't know if intractable is a word, but, but certainly even more difficult right, is that, and you guys intonated this, right? When, when discrete European countries do uh, decide to, uh, you know, to turn to their colonial past in some way, shape or form, it's always in terms of an exceptionalism. So, you know, with, with Britain, it's like, oh no, but the one time we, we do learn about it is the abolition of slavery. So, you know, Britain was the great abolitionist. Then the French, it's like, well, we, we did citizenship. You know, Britons did subjecthood, but we did citizenship, right? Do, do you get what I mean? And every single, um, uh, yeah, you know, in Germany, well, we, we, we're technical, you know what I mean? So every single, or, or like your Greenland thing, thing, you know, Denmark is like, well, yeah, that's not colonialism because that's like in the, in the Arctic, right? <laughs> colonialism only happens in the tropics, right? So every single... Every single country, when it does turn to its imperial past, has an exceptionalist narrative about how it wasn't like all the others. Mm. So it, is it the case, or how is it that we talk about a, a European past of imperialism, or, or even a European in, uh, racism, um, whilst being acute to the, to the differences, to the geographies, but also acute also to the fact that for a lot of people around the world, those, in, those differences don't hit them like that. It hits them as made in Europe. Yeah. Uh, Olivia, what do you reckon? Um, I'm assuming that you said my name, but you broke up, but I'm just gonna... <laughs> yeah, Olivia, so. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna go back to the, the re the reason why, for instance, I refused to be in that expert panel, right? And and one of the of the thing was, um, it's re I think on the one hand, it's really important to train ourselves to to refuse um, both knowledge making, but also commentary, whatever that is just defensive. Where four hundred years later, we're going to still try to prove that racism exists. It just eats all our time, and we know this, right? But on the other hand, when stuff happens, like. Um, Farah mentions the, the critical race theory thing. 
the first thing to do is almost to say like, oh my God, how are we gonna fight this? And, but on the other hand, and I think we should, but, but it's about trying to think um, what part of the fight will be a distraction and what part of the fight will set us on course where we stop accepting the amnesia. And, and I'm say, I say this with a lot of humility in the sense that, especially as educators today, it requires an accelerated self-education of stuff that I was supposed to know, but I never knew, right? And how do you... So the other thing would be try and see that whatever initiative that comes up actually takes us to a radical um, re redistribution of power. And if it doesn't, then it's just virtue politics where, oh, we're gonna add three lines in our history books and then we feel guilty like somewhere when we're 12 and somewhere when we're 18 when we're discussing that period in time and that's it. The reason why people, some people or some parts of the establishment is so hysterical about critical race theory and it's none of, nobody's even doing that, but hysterical about having race at the center of studying the history of the last 400 years is that when you do that, everything Europe knows about itself or everything the West knows about itself collapses, whether it's technological, moral, whatever, any of the superiorities that are ingrained. And, and so I think it's important for us to think um, about those things, not only to fight the little fights where we say we're finally allowed to have but raising the title of a syllabus or, or we change the, the history books, but can we make the inclusion so that we radically study for different purposes? And I think that's the actual struggle. And again, often I give the example of, of um, aid and development studies. If you take racism and colonialism seriously, when you wanna teach kids about global solidarity, aid and development has to go. Like, it, like there is something so fundamental that is not tenable and takes us back to the idea of abolition. We need to think of what has to go, but also we, yeah, there's so much time that we should save somehow. Um, mm -hmm. I went in many different directions, but- No, 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 and, and, no, no, and you're, 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 you're preempting some of the stuff we're gonna talk about in, in a minute, which I do wanna get to, but I, I, I wanna give Chloe the chance to make her contribution and then, and then come back to Gary about any other thoughts about the Europe thing, and then we'll go into the third section. Chloe. Oh, I'm so sorry. I just, I was cleaning my keyboard off and I pressed that by accident. No, I'm just, oh. so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, it's good to hear your voice. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. No, I'm fascinated. I, I think it's really interesting. Um, I, I just, it's just a comment. I, I especially thought that was interesting in terms of comparing um, kind of the sort of environment in terms of the US versus Europe, because as a sort of expat, um, American living in the UK for many years now, it's one of the things that a, um, a couple of my sort of, um, you know, Western Hemisphere friends have talked about is that kind of inability to reflect on, on kind of the existence of racism here um, and, and make that comparison of, well, we're not like America and this sort of thing. And um, so I thought that spoke very, very directly to that is is because that was always kind of my argument is well yeah it exists in your yeah. face in America but people recognize it to some degree um yeah. at least in terms of you know some people might say oh you have to be PC which of course I, I don't think is true but the point is is that you know people recognize it so in here it just sometimes mm -hmm. seems a little bit like there's just no reflection on it but anyway i'm so sorry to do that <laughs> no 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 problem at all man in fact you just made me made me understand something and it's coming off what gary was saying earlier that i remember in the mid 90s when after after 94 in south africa and a lot of white south africans come to live in the uk and there was a viscerality of hatred yeah. to white south africans from white British people, which yeah. I noticed, which I couldn't figure out at the time, like why so visceral? And then I realized it's 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 kind of like this deferral thing. Like, uh, do you get what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. it's a it's a deferral. Yeah. Well, look, yeah, these were the real 
bastards, right? You yeah, know, pardon yeah, no, my French, right? I mean, I would go as far as to say it's projection, right? It's projecting yeah, okay. yourself, you know, and taking mm. it's that exceptionalism to some degree mm. that I think mm. you know all countries are are guilty mm. of to some degree in some mm. area. But but yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, it's just that collective amnesia. I just I find that so odd. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, you could you could talk about the reparations um kind of uh discussion that's going on a bit in the us i mean at least it's being discussed but i i don't mm. even see why why this hasn't just been confronted as a as a post-conflict transitional justice issue of course there have to be reparations i mean it was never dealt with that's why it's you know it, it that mm. yeah it's it's just it's transitional justice that's you mm. know it's no different than a lot of the, you know, I mean, it has its own differences, but you know what I mean, mm. in terms of post-conflict, yeah. it's, it's just the same sort of thing. <laughs> okay. Anyway, sorry, um, but really fascinating. And thank you so much. It's nice to hear you all speaking about mm -hmm. it. <laughs> cool. Gary. Well, there was, there was also an example from here uh, during the war, Robbie, that oh. the Americans were coming um, in the early 40s, the Brits asked them, first of all, not to bring any black people because they, they didn't think they could cope with American racism. Um, this is during the empire. Um, and, um, and they drew the line at the, the, the color bar was the, was the thing that they wouldn't do. And um, uh, they all met in terms of miscegenation. That was the place where uh, American racism and Brit British racism met, was in the bedroom. But that um, the, the, the notion of, and, and it speaks to the kind of the brazen racism of the killing of George Floyd as a person. So this I recognize as racism. This is something brutal, open, as opposed to, and, and, and what's interesting about that is that we talk about amnesia and I was talking about history, but these are things happening in real time. These are things that are concurrent. So you can, you can forget what you're doing while you're doing it, um, uh, which is a kind of, a, an, a, an both an amazing feat and a necessary one for, uh, for states in, in that way. One other thing I would say, reverting back to kind of one of my original points, when you talk about kind of when Europe is so different, how do we talk about European racism? I studied French and Russian. That was my first degree. I studied to be an interpreter. I spent six months in France, which was the most intense racist period of my life. I was beaten up by the cops, among other things. I was stopped and searched at least three times a week, sometimes more by the CRS. And then I went to Leningrad as was, and people thought I was American. And it was in a particular moment where America was something to aspire to. The Soviet Union was on the way out. America was one superpower that just won the Iraq war. And because I was seen as American, it's the only time in my life when I've ever been associated with wealth. People looked at me and they thought, here comes money. In Paris, I couldn't get a cab for love nor money. In Leningrad, cars would stop and turn into cabs. Where do you want to go? I assume you'll be paying dollars. I had to vouch for white people. They're all right. They're with me. They can come in. And um, uh, and so I'm, you know, I'm fully aware. I've experienced. I was the same person, literally wearing the same clothes. In um, and this was in the space of one year. But I would come back to the dialect thing, that they're all speaking the same language and they do have different dialects. And dialects are important. If you get the wrong dialect, you could really misunderstand what's going on. But when the British footballers go to Bulgaria and are racially abused, no one is seriously thinking, what? In Bulgaria? How could this be? Like, and the Bulgarians aren't, those fans who were doing this, they're not working from some um, local sheet, they're working from a global project. And it's impossible, even those states that didn't have uh, colonies, it's impossible to imagine the development of the continent without colonialism. 
and so all are implied and so all are implied also in the you know in the racial right. topography of that right right awesome um so so going on to the last um question now and and this is this is where we have become a little bit more nerdy with, with methodology right um so you both come to to research racism um in politics by formally at least non-academic pathways olivia the civil service um gary media um how have these pathways informed your own research methodologies and 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 what openings might they provide for us us meaning people here on the call who are doing international relations um let's start with olivia Yeah, so um, when when I started my uh, my PhD, I was I was just I thought I was just interested in how some people, some part of the world can die en masse, and we still think that this Western international system works, right? So my my origins um, as a second generation Rwandan, I I was always fascinated by the genocide, obviously as an event, but mostly. Yeah, the discrepancy between this is such a fantastic system if only we make it work technically well, and then the reality of the UN pulling out and a million people dying. I'm doing a lot of shortcuts here. But um, all of this to say that it, it took me, and I often repeat it, um, 12 years to finish a PhD. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to blame that just on, I don't know, the whiteness of the curriculum in general. But it is a huge part of it because um, when when you try to stay true to the actual questions you have as a researcher, um, but try to square that with, I think, in the most westernized university, what you are offered, specifically in IR, for instance, as potential avenues or solutions, then either you move away from your your actual questions or you take a really, really long time. <laughs> <laughs> so let me make that more concrete. So I guess um, what 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 happened, I think, is that um, that it, it was mainly through storytelling and sense making outside of the academy that somehow I found the legitimacy to um, to to engage racism uh, in the international. Um, and I spoke of my personal experiences, but yeah, I worked as a civil servant at the local level in Antwerp for a peace uh, center. Um, and then also I was an Internet European Commission working around uh, human rights and democratization in all of these places that so called want to bring peace on earth racism was not often that explicit, but then when you had to do the practice it's just like hits you in the face, but I guess most importantly it came through observing friends that were very active in anti racist organizing because when I left Belgium. I still had this idea that racism might be a real thing, but then the same way as Gary, like it's just when you actually when you actually become a foreigner somewhere else, wherever your blackness comes at at you in a very very violent, powerful way, and then that shifts in many different uh, ways. The version in uh, in in Italy as a woman is not the police, but you know you're often accosted as a prostitute, whatever. Those are things, but if you if that happens at a moment in your life where you're already there to do a PhD, it's not as violent as when you um, just try to get a job or housing, right? So trying to understand um, all of that. What um, finally, I think what I learned most was from trying to engage as uh, a commentator and a journalist myself, when you have to start to do the storytelling yourself for others, right? So, so to come back to the question, I think what it made clear for me much quicker than academy ever has, academia ever has, is that um, the importance of stating your purpose and the stakes. I do find it and I put it in academia today now as well, and I don't think it, there is a clash. It's not even difficult, especially in the classroom. But um, I think outside the academy, it's easier to keep an eye on why does this matter actually, like, you know. Um, so for me, this is, is a, a thing that I would encourage the fake ass neutrality, objectivity, whatever, this type of very stale understandings of rigor, I think we can really do better. Like there, there is, yeah. 
Um, the other is, I think, uh, revalorizing expertise that comes from experience, and that includes everyone. It, it requires us to do something more with positionality than, you know, um, as um, Jasmine and, and Rabi, I really gave a great presentation this morning on, on stating your positionality and privilege or whatever. I'm not just talking about that, but it's um, how much time would I have saved in those 12 uh, wretched years if I had taken my own positionality more seriously as a source of expertise. And I'm not talking about myself, but again, that's an invitation for uh, most of us. Um, and another point, um, and I think, Robbie, that's something that I pick up also from your work or comments, that you, but thinking through the difference and the similarities between audience and, and constituency, and especially through journalism, that's something that has hit me hard, is that um, on the one hand, you need to write in a way that people can understand what you're saying, and, and, and that's very important, I will end with that. But on the other hand, you need to write in a way that those people you're writing about, you're not insulting them, right? And, and because most of my journalism was based on the African continent, I was very much, I think, confronted with my own lack of knowledge. But on the other hand, enough familial ties to know that if I write something about Rwanda, let me not write it because I might have to show my cousins and it will be just like, I would be so embarrassed, right? But that makes that even if I then decide to write it, you do your extra effort and you still have to translate it for a Flemish audience that has never heard of any of the details. But I think when we're like wringing our hands on, oh, am I allowed to speak? Am I using my privilege or whatever? Thinking also in our research designs or desires in this thing about audience and, and constituency, like who are we accountable to? And who can we not be accountable to, right? There's also some humility there, like if, if, if the distance, then those are things that are quite important. And I think I wanna um, end with a point on, on uh, again, what, what the non-academy has shown me is I think a politics of accessibility. I just really important, especially maybe in our more critical spaces where, and I'm not just talking about making it sound so complicated that nobody really knows what you're saying, but then, you know, you think, but it's, there is something, there is a really a, um, a politics of democratic knowledge, something that that, sh that really should, again, um, make yes. that important. And all of that, um, but that circles back to what we already said, but I'm just gonna mention it here, is, is that for me, it has made the choice at this moment in my life from the place that I write to commit to something like epistemic blackness, not as an exclusionary or the only way to know the world, but I think, um, as a potentially constructive response to white supremacist knowledge, it's a place where we can endlessly get stuff from. And for me, that really translates, um, it can, I can start specifically from people of African descent, but it can never be meaningful unless we mean it also, or first and foremost in a, polit in a black um, political blackness way, right? So those things are not um, mutually exclusive. So if we ask ourselves for any topic that we do, where are the black people in the room or the black experiences? I think it would be good to, to see that as a valid analytical question and not as an identitarian uh, one. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So not just to include them, but to work through what, what it means, what are the implications of us ending their erasure mm. as an open-ended uh, thing. Okay. Thanks. There. Thanks. And that, that that does resonate with Cynthia Enloe's 1980s thing, you know, where are the women, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we'll come back to that in the end. Um, Gary. I, I started at Manchester a week after lockdown. So I have been at home. And so I don't want to dignify really what my approach in this year as kind of a... a a methodology, really. I've been reading books. I've done <laughs> that, you know, because I hear that's what academics do. And I wasn't allowed out, so it seemed like a thing to do. Um, uh, I think if it had been more normal circumstances, I what I know how to do is go and talk to people um and 
I mean, you know, not that journalism doesn't involve other kinds of work, um, but that um, I would have done a bit more traveling. Uh, I'm, I'm itching to get into some archives and also to, because these are the things that you don't have time to do with a, as a journalist, you're working on other people's archival research almost by necessity. Uh, and the truth is, I don't know how to do that. So I have to, um, you know, I have to wait for things to open up and have somebody show me how. Um, um, and um, having just been one year into the profession, I'm not going to claim that I can teach anybody anything, let alone an entire discipline. Um, generally speaking, even before, and this, you know, I do some courses on this is kind of storytelling. And that kind of, um, um, I always think there could be more storytelling and that would be true for academia as well. Just actually, not yarns, not kind of, um, you know, fireside port and stilt and stuff, but um, um, telling stories through people, through place, through time, uh, in the hope that you will engage people in a bigger conversation. Um, and um, I think we could always do with more of that. Right. And, and, and in fact, let, let me ask you then, Gary, coming off from that, you know, looking looking f to the immediate future now, and this impetus that you're putting on the table to 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 value good storytelling, right? Mm. Um, which which links actually to Olivia's kind of position in terms of well, stories always have an audience, right? So there's that that connection, right? How do you think that this this backlash that we're, we're in right now? This is Farai's question. How, how, how this this backlash to you know they're, they're calling it critical race theory, but basically it's any any analysis of structural racism, right? Mm. How, how, how are we going to deal with that, Gary? Especially if we're valuing this storytelling thing. Well, I think that kind of none of this should surprise us, right? That kind of um, if we want to take on this system, the system's not going to go without a fight, not a physical fight, although, you know, who knows, but without a kind of ideological fight. So they're only going for critical race theory, either because they think it's so weak that they can mock it, or more likely because they think it's sufficiently strong and it needs to be in some way stopped. I kind of think, and this speaks to the Sewell report, actually, and the response to the Sewell report, where everything about that report was entirely predictable. From the moment they said who was going to do it, from the moment they said there was going to be a report, you knew it was going to be a terrible report. Then they, And then they kept flagging it, you know, well, we're going to have Tony Sewell on it, and we're going to have these people on it, and, you know, so... I think it's quite important not to then have the mock shock and outrage when they produce a terrible report. Instead, I think, and this is much easier said than done, I know, we should be not kind of responding to every ignorant thing that they do, every vile attack that they do, but because all that means when they do that is that we're in their head, but they don't need to be in our head. And so we have to kind of push ahead with the stories that we think are necessary and important and not be blown off course each and every time they come from us. If we're effective, they will come for us. The, the issue is who will be, be there with us when they come and who will be there with us will be on the basis of the stories that we can tell and the people that we can bring along with them. And so there is this, particularly with social media, there is this, we're in a state of permanent distress action oh my god did you see what they wrote about this did you see what they tweeted about this tony Sewell, it doesn't really matter what tony Sewell says now there's a limit to that it's a government report we can't just completely ignore it i understand that but really were we ever looking for tony Sewell for any kind of lead were we ever thinking that he so if we weren't then let's leave him 
in his own mess. And let's push ahead with the hard and important work that um, uh, that we have to do. I would really love, I'm putting this out there to the universe now, but I've kind of shared this with a couple of people who were kind of keen and then, you know, um, but then who's going to do the work. I would love for us to have something like a truth and reconciliation process in this country. They're not going to do it, but we can. Where we go around a range of cities and have testimony from local people and have testimony from people that we respect and we collect the evidence and we say this is a report. This is a report and this is the process and in the means in the in the process of actually making the report you galvanize people for something kind of bigger it's not just a bunch of words on a page it's something uh, bigger than why they should be worrying about our report not least because our report will be rooted in fact and substance and sh would have the heft of actual people as opposed to a bunch of made up stuff cobbled together that doesn't make any sense so i feel that we have to stop we have to be more disciplined in preventing ourselves from being distracted and push ahead with the stories that we have to tell mm. Okay, thank you. So, so I've got two. Um, we got just under ten minutes, and I've got two. There's a whole load of questions which I wanted to bring in at the end, um, and I've managed to kind of cobble them together into two big, big kind of questions just to finish with. Right now, the first one, Natalie um, um, mooted at the beginning, which was how does gender play in here? And I, so, so let me ask you it like this. Um, so if we think about uh, Gary mentioned Angela Davis, right? So if you think about good, good analysis of racism has to has to be gendered uh, at the same time, right? What um, what do you guys think are the biggest challenges or opportunities in thinking about these geographies of racism and doing it in that good good work, good rigorous work as we define it, which would always have to have a gendered component in it. Um, Olivia, have you got any brief remarks on that? I was, um, I was maybe I'm messing up what you had in mind in terms of the question, but I was, I was looking at Cherry's question, but also uh, Eva's question on if if I open it up to the pot the potential of meaningful solidarities across all these different things that are potentially identity markers, but actually are much more. I think it's much more positionalities of oppression that change according to time, geographies, whatever, but all of them are always there, right? But then the really practical question is, when do we pull out what? You know, when do we draw attention to what? And, and for me, the idea of political blackness, and it's something that I've really come to understand what that might mean by being in the UK, but I also know that the whole uh, fake as an obsession with BAME students now does is an example of how something that is potentially powerful, like third world women or political blackness or all of these things, when we suck any um, genuine potential of solidarity amongst the oppressed people, let's leave it quite wide, what the establishment does is use the same language, but then for neutralizing any type of actual organizing, right? So if I then then um, look specifically at Hiva's question about how do we how do we do that in in practical organizing ways, but especially at university level, where um, that that catchphrase is used to flatten out potential distinctions or not. I would I would come back and it's a bit abstract still, but um, what terminology when allows us to dislocate power and which ones keep everything the same? And sometimes the same labels can do both. So it might be, I'm not saying that words are not important because obviously they are, right? But that might be the thing that we, we should commit to rather than forcing everyone to use X, Y, Z language. Um, and in a very concrete instance of uh, universities wanting to diversify now or paying attention to, um, to our students of color, whatever, they use all that language, 
to pathologize the students of color rather than address white supremacy at the heart of the of the university right i can still use that language to say how much they're doing nothing so but at the same time i think amongst ourselves and i'm going to sound quite divisive but there are moments in which it is important to distinguish between all the different acronyms within those words and sometimes it isn't but i would say this location of power and organizing solidarity around that that's where we know that we cannot have these conversations pretending that there is only one gender if there are genders where gender comes from whatever so the gender question it goes without saying right but it's um and and maybe let me make and because that's really something i wanted to say and um that 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 i got from the reactions to both blm but also the decision for general lockdown that came at the first moment of, of the COVID pandemic in South Africa, it's, it was the comment that at that time in the beginning, there were so many more people that had died of other diseases, right? Like um, HIV AIDS, but also um, tuberculosis. The response was never that of a general panic or a general concern in which we do something that somehow, as Gary was saying, disrupts life as normal or signals that those deaths are not something that we assume to happen in, in Africa, for instance, to, to be generic. And so the roundabout way or the reason why I think about this again, and also maybe why I suggest something like epistemic blackness, but it's actually the situated knowledge thing. Um, that shows us that if we are expansive and really generous in the in the different ways in which we can move between all these different positionalities to understand reality better, <clears throat> that is a thing that will qualitatively our capacity of solidarity. So, so if you if if we refuse the whole thing about competition, but we also refuse the idea that everything is the same for everyone then us having to engage with the fact that a general lockdown is something that only makes sense in, in a Western middle-class thing. Yeah. That is, that I think is, um, and so I'm not sure what I'm saying exactly about positionality, but I think it is important, but not for the reasons that it's often invoked. Right, great. And, and so maybe what I can, because we're gonna have to finish in a minute, but maybe what I can do is just spin that um, into, into something, that you're bringing out already for, for Gary to, to address. Um, and by the way, Gary, did you see Ash's um, comment in the in the chat? Um, Ash is doing something on um, British Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Right. Um, yeah. Um, don't be nervous, Asha. We're all in the same boat, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's always terrifying, man. Um, so, so, Gary, um, a lot of the comments which I'd say for the end were things to do with ending racism, building solidarities, as well as um, doing that in conditions where we've had a, a nationalist xenophobia, populist kind of resurgence, yeah. And Olivia's uh, uh, addressing of that question of gender was to do with, um, to, to do with um, dealing, it at the, uh, dealing with it at the level of um, analytics and ethics, where, whereby your approach is al already you know, this interrelational, intersectional, right? Um, and I, I wonder how you see that there are immediate future in terms of this, in terms of the kind of intellectual work we do, how does it deal with these, um, you know, with, with this erosion of solidarity by various languages uh, um, and dividing in, uh, languages, um, categorizing languages that we've got, plus with all this stuff now imbued into nationalist xenophobia, which is gendered, um, a, a homophobic, um, a, all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, however, I, you want to deal with that. <laughs> I mean, I think that um, th th it's always a challenge with identity, right? That it's a great place to start and a terrible place to finish, and that if we that we we don't want to fetishize these differences are important to recognize, and they are. Um, and sometimes they're not really differences at all. You know, um, how can you understand race without understanding gender? It's, it would, it, you know, it would be a nonsense, which doesn't mean that it's not a different category. 
And my response to Natalie's question would be, oh, have I frozen? No. Uh, my response to Natalie's question would be, either gender plays centrally or we're not talking about race. I mean, we, you know, we, you, you kind of couldn't be, but there is, the challenge is not to fetishize the, um, uh, to fetishize the differences because it is, as you suggest, there is always a risk of us eating ourselves whole um, and um, failing to recognize what the ultimate aim is, which is why I personally choose, I'm, my parents are from Barbados, which is very flat. So I was raised without the notion of a hill to die on. Like, you, you, I'm not gonna die on that hill. You keep that hill, if that's the hill you want, you die on that hill. Um, and of course there are central things that you cannot let pass that without them, you can, but actually um, there aren't as many as we'd think. And that I think as a principle, to move forward with principle, generosity and transparency, that with, with those three things, you can get actually quite a long way. People have to be able to make mistakes, learn from them and move on. And language is there to serve us, not for us to be subject to it. Right. Ooh, plutonium thoughts to finish with, man. Um, I, 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 I just want to say, like, I, my, I went to my first BISA conference in 2003, and I, wo I won't comment on that, but all I'll say is that BISA has come a long way in, in that there's a plenary between these, the, these, these two incredible scholars. Um, one who's, who's with us in IR, one who hasn't been with us in IR, but I, I hope we can... Um, we can um, keep um bugging you <laughs> gary to to, to to walk with us a little bit more down the road um but thanks to both of you for this um incredible conversation i got a lot out of it i'm i'm quite sure the audience did too and eddie what do we do now it's all weird when it's zoom yeah so go yeah, back no, to no, no. For, the, for the instruction <laughs> <laughs> back to marking eddie. <laughs> yeah no, nothing sorry eddie <laughs> Nothing else more to say than uh, thanks for a really, really excellent panel, guys, and I hope to see you uh, some more in, across the next few days. Thank you, Eddie. Right. Thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Bye -bye. <laughs>